in Georgia. Trump's defense team is now appealing Judge McAfee, not on the disqualification issue, which is currently working its way up the Court of Appeals, but on another motion to dismiss based on the First Amendment, saying Trump is protected by our Constitution for the conduct that Fannie alleges is criminal. She says it was a bunch of speaking, and that as the president, he doesn't have the right to do those things. And so the defense is scratching their heads saying, how about we appeal this thing? And they've done that. You remember Steve Sadow, the Georgia Bulldog over there, who was in court and doing a great job. Here is his announcement on this initial step of the appeal. He says, President Trump and others who are unjustly accused defendants have now jointly filed a motion requesting that the court grant a certificate of immediate review. Remember in Georgia, we got to get permission from both sides. The lower level court has to give us the thumbs up. Court of Appeals has to give us a thumbs up and then we take it from there. Grant a certificate of review of its order denying their pretrial First Amendment challenges, which the defense submitted. We covered that here previously. Now the motion, says Steve, powerfully expresses that this indictment from Big Fanny wrongfully criminalizes core political speech and expressive conduct that's all protected by the First Amendment. There is no democracy, says Steve, without robust and uninhibited freedom of expression. And for these reasons, among others, the court order is ripe for pretrial appellate review. This is what Sadow says. In the Big Fanny prosecution, Fulton County, Georgia, state of Georgia versus Trump. This is the motion for a certificate of immediate review appealing the denial of the motion to dismiss the case based on the First Amendment. Now, remember McAfee came out here and on April 4th, he issued an order and that order addresses whether the Constitution bars this indictment here under the First Amendment and under the Georgia Constitution. Now, while McAfee held that this indictment is not subject to a dismissal here and that the challenge criminal state statutes withstand Trump's challenges, he did say that apparently, and as applied, interlocutory appellate review of defendants, quote, vital constitutional protections, they say, is both prudent and warranted. And again, we're here in the middle of a criminal case, so we call this an interlocutory appellate review. Most criminal appeals come after the conclusion of a trial, but this we're doing it in the middle because you can't redo the election, right? If Trump is bogged down in a criminal prosecution in the middle of an election, there are collateral consequences to that. So they say this is prudent. The Court of Appeals should accept this in Georgia, because if successful, if they win, it would bar virtually every count of the indictment against virtually every defendant. Resolution of these issues is important. We need to get this settled before we have multiple lengthy jury trials with 19 co-defendants, which is down to 15. So both sides, now this challenge relates to core political speech, and it also relates to the 2020 presidential election. So it's free speech combined with a very important election. Now, while the defendants cited a plethora of U.S. Supreme Court cases that McAfee's like, whatever. No Georgia appellate courts have even addressed this. Whether a Georgia statute can survive the criminalization of defendants' core political speech. We get some case law here, and they tell us that here's what Trump's argument is, along with the other co-defendants. They say that their challenged speech is core political speech related to an election, right? Fannie said that there was a conspiracy. Trump said a bunch of things that led to a conspiracy. No, that's not criminal language. That's political speech. Now, other than Trump's speech that led to this so-called conspiracy, the indictment does not challenge or point to any other activity that subjects them to prosecution. And even if the indictment alleges that the speech was knowingly or willfully false, which is what the law requires the court to assume, their speech is still protected by the First Amendment. Again, other than saying that the defendant's speech violated some criminal statutes, the indictment does not specify what other criminal conduct, aside from the speech, was committed here. It's just speech. Like, that's the actual conduct. Now, based on more than 45 mostly U.S. Supreme Court cases and other historic precedent, the defense believes that their arguments are well-founded, and they fall squarely within the almost absolute First Amendment protections in the context of other core political speech in the context of the 2020 election. Now, there are no cases cited by this court or by Fannie in which a statute that criminalizes core political speech survives First Amendment strict scrutiny. So there's no other good examples. Thus, what appears to be a sui generis finding in the April order, like of its first impression, based on a novel legal theory by the state, cries out for an immediate review. So the, the judge, this is the first time you've addressed this. This is the first time 
This has been brought up in Georgia. And so it is subject to review. We need another court to take a look at this thing and make sure that we're okay here. Now, importantly, they say McAfee's order questions without finding whether the speech alleged in the indictment was in fact political. He's like, I don't know. McAfee said, the defense has not presented, nor is the court able to find any authority that the speech and the conduct alleged is protected speech. But the deluge of case law cited by Trump does plainly characterize the speech alleged in the indictment as protected. Like, read the cases, judge. Now, the court is aware, however, and they're correct that Georgia appellate courts have not directly addressed this, especially as it comes to challenges made under the Electoral Count Act, like the type of speech is about the election, about the Electoral Count Act, like one of any cases on point to that, and Georgia appellate courts have not addressed this at all. So the legal question about the nature and the characterization of the speech at issue is outcome determinative, meaning it's going to dispose of this case. We're going to have a decision if we decide this legal issue. And so the question of what type of speech is targeted in the indictment and in the statute, it demands review. Whether the statements in the indictment are political in nature is a question of law for the courts to decide. And how do we decide that? Well, courts are compelled to examine statements and they're determining whether they're a character of which the principles of the First Amendment apply. For example, in the criminal context, quote, a prosecution motivated by a desire to discourage expression that's protected by the First Amendment is barred and it must be enjoined irrespective of whether the challenged action could possibly be found to be unlawful. Saying numerous other decisions rendered in related First Amendment contexts also illustrate the legal nature of speech characterizations. How do we quantify the speech? And it's a tough question that we have to analyze. And that's why the Court of Appeals needs to hear this. Additionally, the court says that there is a broad principle that there is, quote, speech integral to criminal conduct, fraud, or speech presenting an immunity threat is not protected. There are exceptions to free speech. Now, again, the court and the state rely on only cases outside the context of political speech. It's not about political speech, the cases that they're relying on. And so they apply a lower standard other than strict scrutiny. As the Arneson Court, citing U.S. Supreme Court precedent makes clear, political speech is in the context that is subject to strict scrutiny review, the highest level of scrutiny under our jurisprudence. And in this context, the speech at issue about the 2020 election is absolutely protected because the sole criminal allegations are premised upon the speech itself. So we need the Court of Appeals to help us figure this out. And in this context, this quote, integral to illegal conduct exception just does not apply here. And neither the state nor the court wrestled with this context. The best understanding of integral to illegal conduct exception is this. When the speech attempts to cause or makes a threat to cause some illegal conduct, right? It's the conduct. The speech relates to conduct, like it's solicitation of drugs, but there's drugs there that you're going to solicit to buy. So it's going to transfer the drug, right? There's an underlying conduct. It's not just solicitation now, or like solicitation of prostitution, same thing. There's an act there that you're about to go engage in. It's not just the thing. It's like murders, fights of restraints of trade, child abuse, discriminatory refusal to hire. Okay. Those are the types of speech that are in furtherance of illegal conduct. That's not what Trump has done here, but the scope of these restrictions must still be narrowly defined. Now, nowhere in Fannie's indictment, nowhere in the April 4th order, does anyone point to any illegal conduct other than the prohibited speech itself. So it is a statute that criminalizes speech that's illegal. Now, our review also reveals none, but rather Fannie says that because it pled that Trump's speech allegedly violates other statutes, it's integral to those statutes. Now, this is novel. It's purely circular, and the theory needs to be vetted by the higher courts. For if it is accurate, then any First Amendment challenges are dead on arrival, and they can never support a demur in Georgia, which is the challenging of the indictment. That's because to hurdle the First Amendment barriers to speech, the high barriers, all the state would need to do is just say, oh, it's a RICO violation. There you go. No protections. Now, if that's the case, and this court seems to think it is, that would vitiate First Amendment challenges all over the place. And this is not appropriate. It's core political speech. And this court already recognized the clear importance of the vital constitutional protections at play. And so Trump's First Amendment challenges are of paramount concern for both the efficient resolution of this matter and for the protection of Trump's First Amendment rights. This is especially true given that there's very little guidance on this. And this is why the Georgia Court of Appeals needs to hear this case respectfully submitted to Judge Scott McAfee by Christopher S. Anilwich from Georgia and other defense attorneys like Steve Sadow, Ashley Merchant, boom right there, and the amazing defense attorneys on the RICO case all seen here.
here. So that got submitted in. And what we're waiting for now is for Judge McAfee to grant permission to say, okay, great. You're right. This is a novel issue. It's a complicated question of law. There is no precedent here. And so permission granted, why don't you take that up to the Court of Appeals? And then we'll see if the Court of Appeals ultimately accepts that. But again, we're waiting for one of these appeals to take, because if it does, then there's a question about whether the underlying prosecution is stayed, held in abeyance until we get conclusions on these. And then that would postpone the Georgia trial until certainly beyond the election. So we're going to be here continuing to cover this, my friends. We've got Vivek here who has a little bit of optimism to share in the face of all these prosecutions, saying that if people can just compare side by side Joe Biden's performance versus Donald Trump's performance, it's pretty easy to see who's competent, who's capable, and hopefully our fellow Americans recognize this, see this, and vote accordingly. The unique part of this election, this is historic, and I just want to say this on a positive note. We only get this once in a century where voters get to choose between two presidents who have both been the president before. That doesn't happen usually. It was Grover Cleveland the last time around. So that's a unique opportunity in this election that voters have at the top of the ticket to say, it's not a challenger to Biden who's offering you hopes and dreams. It's a challenger to Biden who's already done it. Compare four years of Trump to four years of Biden. That's a once in a century opportunity. And if voters seize that, I think we can have a landslide that unites this country. That's what this country needs. And as Donald Trump has said, and I love it when he says this, success will be our vengeance. That's, That's right, how baby. we're going to be the party. Biden promised to unite the country. He didn't do it. That's what Republicans are going to do this year. And I think that's how we're going to make our nation greater than it's ever been before so that our best days are still ahead of us. I truly believe that. All right. So shout out to Vivek with a little bit of optimism and positivity there. I think these people are exposing themselves. I think that they've bitten off way more they can chew. You know, if somebody did something criminal, you don't have to have a whole public relations campaign to do it. You don't need to have Liz Cheney come out and have eight different book reports that she has with Benny Thompson to fake a narrative for the whole country to buy. They know they're illegitimate. They know they lack credibility and that people are waking up. So they're freaked out. They're using all their last levers of power in order to get this thing worked out. It's like that end scene at Terminator with a T-1000 flailing around and they're just trying to escape the momentum here because people are recognizing how corrupt and partisan these all are. We see it and more people are seeing it every day. And we're going to be here continuing to cover all of this litigation throughout the election season and beyond. And we're grateful that you join us. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video, for sharing it with a friend or family member, for inviting them to come join us for our live streams. We also have some great links down in the description below, including watchingthewatchers.locals.com, our members only community, where we do live streams in the morning, streams on Saturday. We have an amazing community there. We talk about a bunch of other stuff that we can't get to here, and we would love to see you join us. So come check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. My friends, we'll see you over there, and we'll see you back here on the next one. Thank you.